going down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin can be very, very sobering. And uh, this is why I'm really looking forward to talk to Dominic Frisbee, a brilliant you know, comedian, researcher, author, uh, author of, uh, you know, uh, quite some books, you know, Daylight Robbery, How Tax Shaped Our Past and Will Change Our Future, uh, Bitcoin, The Future of Money. That's the one book that I've read so far. And the other one is Life After the State. And yeah, check him out on Twitter. And um, without further ado, we're going to talk about, you know, lots of things, nation states, governments, central banks, military industrial complex, uh, you know, crimes against humanity. And, you know, what is what are the root causes and what are, what is the root solution? And that can only be you know, the once in a lifetime, once in a human civilization chance, and that is Bitcoin. So we're going to talk really about a lot of aspects and really looking forward to this talk. And uh, I hope you're going to enjoy this. All right. Dominic, Dominic Frisbee, welcome to the show. How are you, man? Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Listen, I mean, I, I didn't know you till recently. I think the first interview was with um, uh, Daniel Prince, and then I followed up oh, you yeah. know, on some other on some other interviews. And I mean, your whole you know position and your values, your vision. We are we are so much on pay. I mean, uh, you know, not only because you're a Bitcoiner, but because you're so critical, you question everything. I, I love, by the way, your writing style. You know, uh, and since you know the day is only 24 hours, I just made you know finished the book, uh, the Bitcoin book. You know, but I'm planning oh, really? to yeah yeah, but I'm planning to to read the other ones too because I just you know love your approach to you know I, I have to dig deeper into this whole taxation and the robbery right <laughs> so, um and nation states and, and 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 you know i mean some people come from different angles why don't you just tell me or my listeners um about yourself because what i'm re what i'm really curious like you're a comedian too and i know you know the artists with a comedian or any kind of artist they, they i think a lot of artists don't know i know you do but most artists i have the feeling don't know the real power they can exert in communicating you know when it comes to transformational uh, uh you know to evolution to transformation to changing the the roots of our structures and i think you know as a comedian you have the power to you know to make people understand with with a sense of humor with cynicism with sarcasm whatever that is whatever whatever tools you have at your disposal so what's your journey <laughs> down well, I, I, I started out life as a comedian. Well, I actually started out life doing voiceovers. And uh, then I wrote a song. And, um, uh, well, I always, I always wanted to be a writer. And, uh, and I looked at all the best writers, and all the best writers had started out as actors. So I thought, I'll, I'll start out as an actor. And then when I went to drama school, for some reason, I was the best at radio. <laughs> Maybe I've got a good face for radio. And uh, so I, um, I don't know why, but I, I was just good at voiceovers. I got signed up by a voiceover agent and I just started doing voiceovers. And it was quite a nice life when you're in your early 20s. It was very well paid. You were very well treated. And uh, so I was doing that. And, but you get a sort of lot of, it's not a nine to five job voiceovers. You get quite a bit of spare time. And I used to sort of write and I wrote this song. And then some, I wanted to release the song as a Christmas novelty single. This would have been about 1996, 1987. And, a friend of mine said, oh, no, don't. my friend of mine was a music agent and he said, go and do it in my brother's club. So I went and did it in his brother's comedy club and it was a disastrous night. Everyone got booed off and I had a really good gig. And so the people who own the comedy club booked me for another gig. And, and a week later and the, the, the next time they, they paid me money. And so suddenly I was a, I was a comedian with this song. And... Um, you know, combining the two incomes of being a comedian and doing voiceovers by about the mid noughties, I'd earned a bit of money and um, I wanted to invest it. And I started, you know, reading on the internet about where to invest the money. And I started, I discovered gold fairly quickly. It was in a big bull market at the time. And I, it really, the narrative around gold really chimed with me. It made sense to me. And so I started investing in gold. And then once you start investing in gold, you realize it's a very political investment uh, because gold was money once upon a time. And I started learning about free markets and individual liberty and the role of the state. And suddenly, once you studied gold, you understood why house prices were so ridiculously expensive, which is, which is something I'd never previously been able to understand before. And uh, suddenly I understood about the creation of fiat money and so on. And there were all these really interesting people talking about gold 
<laughs> and I really wanted to find a way to meet them without having to pay them for their time. So I started a podcast. It was very easy for me to start a podcast, even back then in 2006. Uh, it, was, I mean, it was harder then than it is now, but, but for me it was easy because I was used to microphones and things like that. So I started this podcast. I interviewed people like Jim Rogers and Mark Farber and James Turk and you know, really clever guys. And, um, and that's how I got started. And one of the people I interviewed was this woman called Mary Somerset Webb, who ran Money Week magazine. And she said, oh, we need people like you to come and write for us. And I said, well, I don't really know what I'm talking about. She said, it doesn't matter. Come and write for us. And so I wrote, started writing a column for Money Week in, I guess, 2007. And, and I'm, here we are, 14 years later, still writing a, a weekly column for them. So that's been a nice, that's, that's sort of how it all started. And then, um, you know, you meet various people. You just, you, you can't really control where your life takes you. It takes you in all sorts of strange places that you didn't necessarily plan or expect. Um, this is one of the reasons I'm so opposed to state planning because things just events don't just organize themselves in the way that necessarily you want them to. Um, and, and, um, this guy called Ross Ashcroft came to me and said, I've written this film, but I can't make it work. And I looked at it and I spent maybe three or four months completely rewriting it for him and re-editing it. And then that and introduced a whole lot of new stuff to it. And that film became a film called four horsemen. And that was, you know, a huge hit on the internet. And, and um, that gave me the confidence to realize I could write oh books. My, and I wrote oh this book in life you, you, after you this. Were part, you were part of the Four Horsemen. I saw that on, on yeah, I saw that like, like uh, a few months ago, or I think. I didn't know that you are part of that. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, well, I wasn't properly credited, so people yeah. don't know. But I wrote it and, uh, well, co-wrote it and narrated it as well. Excellent. And, um, you know, and, 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 and then from there, I wrote a book called Life After the State. And... It was while I was writing Four Horsemen, actually, that people started telling me about Bitcoin. And I was <laughs> so swallowed up in, in the studios working on Four Horsemen. I should have been going to Bitcoin conferences. This would have been about 2012, 2013. Anyway, then I wrote Life After the State. And the solution of Life After the State is if we're going to save the world, we need to change our system of money. And that had like a page on it about Bitcoin. And I've, I'm sure that's the first page on Bitcoin in a proper book. And then while I was writing it, Bitcoin started going up and up and up. And I was like, oh, I've got to write about Bitcoin because here's the free market providing the solution uh, to the problem. And, um, and so then I wrote the Bitcoin book. And, and, you know, I think money is being fixed. And my big thing is the two things we need to fix in the world is, is, is the first thing we need to fix is money. We need to have healthy money that, you know, one body can't doesn't have the power to print it needs to be independent nobody can print it gold did that and bitcoin does that you know the the inflation rate is is pretty much set in stone i mean it's not it's it's set in code in bitcoin and in gold the inflation rate is is set because it's just rare and there just isn't that much of it and i think gold supply grows at about two percent per annum it grows at exactly the same rate as the population so <laughs> it, it's it's steady and constant and there's never going to be sudden you know, what happened to the Spaniards in the 16th century where they brought back all the gold from the Americas and created huge inflation at home uh, and, and destroyed their empire. That's unlikely to happen now. Um, and then, but then my next theory was, is that, that, that um, you need to, if you're going to fix society, you need to fix the way, you need to fix money and then you need to fix tax because tax is the way you design a society, the way the power structures are set. And tax is inevitable. There's never been a society without taxation. But if you're going to save the world, you need to fix tax. Fix tax, you, you fix society. And so that's when I started work on my latest project, which is this one here, Daylight Robbery, how tax shaped our past and will change our future. So that's, that's me. That's, that's an amazing hard. story. Amazing. Not, not, as, not as rich as I should be, but I, I'm, I'm doing my best. Oh, you're doing, you're doing <laughs> great. Uh, so, Dominic, what do you think is the, when it comes to taxes, what, what do you think is the perception of people? Uh, do you think we take gr uh, taxes for granted? Because I, I talk to a lot of people and they say, you know, if it wasn't for taxes, they would contribute voluntarily. And I think, you know, and I think it's in, the, in our nature, you know, to give back to our, you know, local community, to society, to people, you know, who, whatever that is, you know, it could be kindergarten or for the road or the infrastructure. I mean, what, what do you think is the perception when it comes to tax taxes? yeah well i i completely agree with that sentiment 
that and one of the things I argue in the book is that taxation is as old as civilization itself. There's never been a society without some kind of taxation. But there is a difference between forced taxation and voluntary taxation. And there have been examples in history where societies had voluntary taxes. I agree. There's a sort of, one of the things I argue is that there a sense of duty to the greater collective existed even in the hunter-gatherer societies that predated civilization, if that makes sense. We all have this in us. We all want to give something back. And I think bizarrely, ironically, when we have the current system of taxation where it's forced and it's set in law, you are incentivized to pay as little as you legally can. Whereas Whereas in a voluntary society, you might actually find that people give more than they're expected. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. Because people have a tendency, you know, to be so, generous, um, right? They, yeah. And also, like, in the way taxes are at the moment, taxes are, are taken. Nobody says thank you. You can't see the benefits of your spending. You have no relationship with how your money's taken and what it's spent on. Often your money is spent on things that you are morally opposed to. So for example, you, I was against the Iraq war. I think most people were against the Iraq war, but our taxes were taken. We worked hard. Our taxes were taken. Our labor was effectually, effectively sequestered <laughs> and spent on the Iraq war. And, and, you know, there's the two arguments. There's the libertarian argument, which is taxation is a form of theft. And it is because it's taken from you by force. If you don't, if you don't uh, pay taxes, you go to jail. And then there's the other argument, uh, which is inscribed on the IRS building in America. Um, taxes are the price we pay, we pay for a civilized society. Well, I would, uh, and, and, both those statements are inherently contradictory, but they're both true. <laughs> but I would argue that a civilized society does not force people to labor for things to which they are morally opposed. That's yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you. So, uh, Dominic, I mean, what do you think? Um, you know, a few years ago, I, I, I just stopped uh, going to the voting uh, polls. Or what do you call it? Uh, the you? Boots, uh, boots, you know, like, like I stopped voting because I'm, I'm yeah. like, because once you understand, you know, the, the root causes and the structure and I mean, what am I, what am I giving, what am I giving my vote away to, 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 to preserve uh, and conserve, you know, conservate, you know, the, 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 the legacy system, you know, the structure, it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, red, green, blue, brown, or whatever, light, uh, left, right wing, or conservative, or liberal, or green party, it's all the same shit. So I think, you know, if it comes to practical, like, uh, taking action, human action, you know, as we uh, using the Austrian economy's words, what what would be the steps, you know, or what what would be the process to make people understand, you know, as long as you're going to vote, you're going to, you know, keep the keep the uh, status quo uh, as it is. Which country are you based in? I'm in Austria. I mean, I was born in Iran, but I came to Austria it, uh, when I was seven years old, and I grew up like five years in the United States. But I'm, I live in Austria for like, I don't know, 40 years or something. And is Austria, is it, is it a, is it a two party system in Austria? No, it's actually a multi party system. So is your government a coalition? Uh, to be honest with you, I don't, I'm not, I'm not watching any kind of mainstream news, uh, okay. deliberately, but well, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. I, I would argue that with elections like America, for example, you know, I know they've got a libertarian party, but America is basically a two party system. It's only really Republican or Democrat that can ever, ever stands a realistic chance of winning. And the UK as well, we have oh, five or six or five or six parties, but only really two can win Labour and Conservative. And so effectively, you find you, uh, so, and, and at the end of the day, an election is basically an argument of how much of GDP that they're, they're going to spend. 
how big that's effectively what the argument is how much of your money are we going to spend right. and with a with a left of center government it's they're going to say it's 55 50 55 percent and with a right of center government it's maybe 45 or 50 percent so it's basically an argument about two or three or four percent of gdp it's not you you're, you're not going to achieve any meaningful change through the ballot box the electoral system um and and i i uh, don't vote i actually draw a massive penis on my ballot <laughs> paper and i give that in so that's that's um that so i go i i think it's important because at least that makes a statement um but the the so i would argue that an election broadly speaking is the illusion of yeah, choice exactly it's a theater it's, it's, it's but it's theater. really i mean it's a it's farce you just choose it's, it's it's a theater the one the one election in my lifetime where that didn't apply was brexit yeah because that was a uh, that was there was a definite outcome that you were voting for mm -hmm. and then when they got the outcome <laughs> that, that they didn't want <laughs> they tried their best to stop it happening they did everything they could to undermine it but you know so th when it's a referendum like that over a very definite issue you know should we legalize cannabis mm -hmm. or you, you know whatever the, the issue is should should um edward snowden be freed or you know when it's a definite issue and there's a referendum about it that's different to a general election right so dominic you know we let's talk about because the the underlying uh, uh root problem you know i mean above you know it's you know taxation i think is one aspect but if we look at it i mean we have this 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 these power structures right we have this nation state the government uh, in collusion, whatever, vice versa, you know, are actually the po the political or governmental structures are instrumentalized, in my opinion, you know, by the central banks. So if we zoom out, how would you describe, you know, to the average people out there, like, how, how can we like understand what needs, you know, the, the Bitcoin is the, is the ultimate tool. I think this is the one in a humanity civilization chance to totally transform everything we've ever known or could ever imagine. And, you know, it's, it's this monopoly on violence, coercion, aggression, right? It's a nation state, the government, we have the central banks that has total criminal immunity. How would you like describe or visualize for people like what, what are we, you know, what are we struggling with, with here actually? Well, the beauty of Bitcoin is that it gives you the opportunity to opt out and you can start using Bitcoin and you no longer need to save your wealth in fiat money, in banks, in, go in government bonds, in government assets. It gives you an escape. And it's created the beauty of the Internet and the digital economy generally is that it has also created an escape. Here is a whole new economy and you can buy and sell and trade in exchange and you can do so beyond the control of governments and you know most countries are designed around national borders and those national borders are actually fairly new like there's a great passage from a book a history book by AJP Taylor that was written in 1940 that he describes 1914 so only 100 years ago and he says um, an Englishman could go through life and barely notice the existence of the state beyond the policeman and the postman. He didn't need to carry papers with him. He uh, could buy and sell money anywhere in the world. He could travel anywhere in the world and he didn't need a passport. So this idea of borders and, and, and passports and all this kind of thing is, is fairly new. It's only about 100 years old, if that. And, and it if was I may brought just, on by war. Yeah, if I may just interrupt, you say, you know, I mean, I read, you know, the Bitcoin standard by Safir and Amos. That's the first time I actually understood that the gold standard, uh, you know, uh, was actually or factually uh, abolished or, you know, gotten rid of like shortly before 1914 or around 1914, right? I think this is a lot, that, that's a fact that a lot of people, uh, I missed it. I didn't learn that about, the, you know, about these kind of things in school. That's, that's the dilemma. Yeah, we have. no, France. 
They, ne- they never teach you that. They, they talk about, they always make you learn the causes of the First World War at school and they don't mention the gold standard. <laughs> they don't mention the money. The, the, the British and the French and the German governments all abandoned the gold standard in 1914 in order to be able to print the money to pay for World War I. If those countries, if those governments had only been able to spend as much money as they had gold in their vaults, that war could not have gone on for as long as it did because the governments did not have the money to pay for it. The only way they paid for it was by was fiat money, by abusing gold, the gold standard. And what was perpetrated was one of the biggest human disasters, if not the single biggest human disaster in all human history. I think if you include the Spanish flu that followed, that had its roots in the trenches, over 50 million people, 50 million people lost their lives in, uh, because of the First World War. And if they'd, if they'd kept their money true, it would not have been possible for it to go long on for as long as they did, as long as it did. That's incredible. I mean, it's it just sometimes it's beyond, uh, you know, the power of words it's to describe, you know, the crimes against humanity that's been perpetrate, perpetrated by these, whatever, you know, power structures. So, you know, what... It's what, terrible. It's terrible. Yeah. Gold limits, like, if you look at the biggest mass murders carried out in history, they have all been carried out by rulers whether it's kings or governments whatever it is it's all been carried out by rulers and the beauty of having an independent money Mm -hmm. that no ruler can print is it limits the extent to which they can rule right and mathematics code cryptography i mean it's rules immutable decentralized rules there's never been i mean this is so this is so ground this is so mind-boggling i think people haven't really thought that through you know when uh, i'm sure you know you've been deep into the rabbit hole and you might have maybe listened to robert brio read some things about uh, robert breedlove's articles like how much time you know, and, and energy and everything else and resources has been stolen from humanity, you know, through the central banking structures and governments. But it's not only that, but what kind of prosperity and abundance we could have had in the last hundred years and in technological innovations in, you know, whatever, in the last decades or in the last hundred years, if it wasn't, you know, for these governmental nation state central banking structures and the military industrial corporate complex. <laughs> Imagine, imagine the 20th century without World War I, World War II, and, and, you know, Vietnam, Iraq. Imagine it without all those wars. What an amazing time it would have been. And, you know, if people had been able to vote, do you want the war? I think most people would have voted, no, we don't want the war. But because the, of the, the power over money made all that atrocity possible. Fiat money has caused more needless loss of life than any more loss of life than nuclear bombs. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm always trying, you know, to, 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 dis- to put it like to uh, make it make it uh, like, like, uh, you know, it, it's, it's important to understand the root cause. I think every person, every soul needs to go into the rabbit hole, into the into Bitcoin's rabbit hole. It's like so multifaceted. But once you understand, you comprehend the bigger picture and the essence of it, and then you zoom out, uh, you know, you really begin, you know, as a lot of people say, I'm just paraphrasing, you know, uh, some, you know, most people, you know, come into Bitcoin for, for the money and, but they stay, whatever. I mean, I, I always say I, I, I come here, you know, I came for the money or whatever for number go up or for uh, wealth and, uh, you know, financial monetary independence and, and whatever. But, but then, you know, you stay for the, for the, for the evolution, for the vision, for, for the freedom, for real freedom. And, uh, you know, I'm, and, and, and this is this is one aspect that, that really fascinates me. And that that's the you know main reason. I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe you can tell me what is your vision? Uh, this is, you know, a core aspect that I want to talk to talk to you about with other guests. Like what what kind of human civilization? can we create once, you know, everything is rooted in Bitcoin, you know, once we reach uh, hyper-Bitcoinization, you know, we have localized economies, we have uh, scientists, researchers, entrepreneurs, uh, service providers instead of nation, uh, instead of governmental structures, providing services, products, uh, and we have, you know, finally zero to one technological innovation uh, coupled with deflationary economies, you know, uh, uh, to quote, you know, Jeff Booth, 
it's like it's so overwhelming i think the vision but it's reality that we can create so what is it that you can envision or can maybe convey to the listeners what is possible with bitcoin well i admire all those goals and i share all those goals and dreams but i don't think it's going to be plain sailing i think it's, there's a there's a big power struggle coming and you know governments don't relinquish power easily and they've they've pretty much without exception have taken on obligations spending plans that they cannot currently meet from the revenue they generate in taxes and so they're compensating by inflating the money and 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 borrowing um but as they as they debase their currencies and we see this we're going to see the rise of this two-tiered economy much as um as described as in the sovereign individual where there's going to be some people who are able to move they won't be stuck in one country they'll be working in the digital economy they'll be traveling from place to place doing very well having good lives and then there will be other people who are stuck in the physical economy who will be burdened with heavy taxation they will be dependent on government services and there's going to be anger rising up between these two um different groups jealousy envy you look at how angry people get because google's not paying its taxes and apple and amazon aren't paying its taxes well that anger's going to start applying to these digital nomads these sovereign individuals as well and so you're going to see some wiser governments embrace them invite them to their countries come here come and do business we want your trade we want your business and there'll be low tax jurisdictions and they'll do fairly well but there will be others who will try and stop them moving around who will try and tax them who will try and take their money and those will be the nations that do less well and they'll become the more authoritarian modern technocratic with everyone living on UBI you know in virtual reality headsets living in kind of butlins <laughs> but they they or club med or something like that I, i do think that's the thing there'll be people everyone's going to be in these mini club meds with their food giving to them and their virtual reality headsets and so there's going to be a lot of tension between the two and it's all very well saying ah uh, well the soviet union imploded and uh because it couldn't meet its obligations and eventually it imploded but it wasn't like I th you know a lot of the existing government infrastructure stayed even after the soviet union imploded and so while there's a lot of hope and a lot of opportunity for example across eastern europe you know a lot of that implosion was pretty messy and so i think you'll just see it's a bit it'll be a bit like a um a, a field or or a or a, a woodland that gets decimated by you know a war or a, a load of woodcutters or whatever come to the woodland or a meteor strikes the woodland or whatever it is and it just gets totally burnt out and then you'll just see pockets little oases pockets of growth here pockets of greenery there flower a few flowers there it's not all going to blossom into an amazing amazon rainforest at once it'll just be you know little pockets of growth and um beauty and uh and and good places to be and uh, those pockets will a lot of the basis of those economies will be uh in you know bitcoin and free market independent money Yeah, I, I want to talk to you about you know what do you think about the rise or emergence of of citadels and free private cities. But let me go back yeah to that point. You you really made a good valid point. You know, we, we had a talk you know with Eric Kaysen and Dave Collum and uh, Eric Vasquil, uh, and I tried you know, to to do a series of interviews like focus like on sort of a, make a reality check because Dave Collum says you know this state you know the nation state is never going to allow Bitcoin and they're going to whatever really go clamp down on Bitcoiners so you know it's going to be a really 
a pretty heavy transition phase. I'm, I totally agree with you. But how do you think it could could play out? Or what kind of scenarios do you think it could play out? I mean, you know, considering we have, as you said, you know, the power structures are not just going to give away the power. <laughs> We're talking about like a huge, a vast military industrial intelligence complex in, you know, totally tight knit, you know, with the central banks and governments. Uh, it, I mean, what's 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 the picture here? Well, you look at what's happened with COVID, and I'm not quite sure where I stand on COVID. You know, I listen to all the arguments and I just sort of, I don't know, I haven't figured it out. But I've listened to some of the, uh, you know, the easy explanation is that it's a virus that came from China and the governments have done their best to, to protect their people and the choices they've made have been lockdowns and all the rest of it. And then I listen to some of the conspiracies, again, that it's a virus that came from China, but loads of opportunities, opportunists have taken advantage of it and to impose their designs. And so, um, but one thing we've definitely seen as a result of COVID is that government control has increased. And you tend to see this in it's very hard to extend control in peacetime, to raise taxes and so on in peacetime. You need the excuse of a crisis, usually a war. And then what happens after the crisis has passed is that things never go back to how they were before the crisis began. And you see, you know, the obvious example is income taxes in World War II. Um, you know, income tax barely affected anyone before World War II. And then suddenly by the end of World War II, everyone was paying income tax and they never went back to the levels they were before the war started. Same applies to the First World War. So we've seen COVID as an excuse for incredible amounts of money printing, huge levels of debt, huge levels of government spending, unprecedented levels. And these have all become normalized, furlough money, which is basically universal basic income by another name. Like I was sort of in favor of universal basic income on the grounds that it simplified welfare and it treated everyone equally, everyone the same amount. Um, whereas furlough is like, it's like does everything UBI does, but makes it complicated and it isn't equal. So, but anyway, it's still UBI by the back door. Yeah. And so, but what concerns me most is the limits on movement. Exactly. This that is have what been really able concerns me. to yeah. be placed. Yeah. And it makes it very difficult for the digital nomad, the sovereign individual to lead his life. And connected and, with the, you know, the man only way mandated vaccinations. I mean, this is the nightmare. Yeah, you know, I'm, we have a four month baby so, girl. And I'm like, what are we going to do? Like, if we want to travel, we have to vaccinate us and, and, and our child. I mean, this is this is crazy. It's insane. They haven't again, tested it. Well, exactly. And, and you can say, oh, well, the vaccination's harmless. Look, everyone's had it. But oh. we still don't know what the long term effects exactly. are. And, yeah. you know, there's so many. It's really. I mean, I haven't had the vaccine yet, but, you know, if I have to have it in order to travel, then I'll probably have it, albeit mm -hmm. reluctantly. Mm -hmm. um, but the, I agree, but, but the fact is, whether the vaccine is good for you or bad for you, it's another government control. Right. And I thought, you know, even with passports and visas, I thought, broadly speaking, governments were fairly in favour of free movement. And, but now they seem to be changing their tune. And, and so, you know, that's one way by which the sort of Bitcoin sovereign individual lifestyle is not going to be as easy as we thought it was. I mean, the idea, like I like the dream of, you know, these new, in, this, in the same way that in the olden days, if there was a mine, if somebody made a discovery and there's gold or copper or something, then they'd build a mine and then a huge city would emerge where that mine was and you know a huge industry would come up there and i rather like the idea that something similar is going to happen with bitcoin miners and these pockets these remote pockets of the world where energy is very cheap but they're sparsely populated and the energy if the bitcoin miner wasn't there then there'd been no one would use that energy and um, and you know suddenly whole communities are going to be spring up around these bitcoin mines um you know i like that idea of principle but you know the Bitcoin mining community is still in another country. It's not going to be its own little citadel. 
And so unless Bitcoin gets to the stage where it's such a large market cap. This is, a group this is what Bitcoin's I want to ask you. The, if the projections are correct, you know, we're going to have like a, a billion, at least a billion uh, Bitcoin as users, you know, uh, by 2025 20, well, or something. You know? Yeah, but maybe the market cap of Bitcoin goes to the extent that, you know, a bunch of Bitcoiners can get together and go to, you know, the government of Liberia or the government of wherever and say, we want to buy uh, however many acres of land. You know, we want to buy 50,000 hectares of land off you and we want you to recognize it as an independent nation state. And it might be that some countries are so desperate for Bitcoins uh, because fiat's lost all its money, that they will be prepared to sell you land, and then these sovereign states can yeah. be built. The, the, the problem that's yeah. a long way to go before yeah. we get to that, and it's not clear. You know, Liberia, or I'm just using Liberia uh -huh. because it's the first African yeah. country that came to mind, but it could be Mali, it could be anyway. Chad, you know, right? Chad, I want to buy this chunk of desert right in the middle of Chad. Nobody uses it, and I'm going to send up a an independent. I'm going to build an airport there and build an independent nation state. You know, would Chad recognize it? it? It might well. And 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 they would have to hire an army to defend its borders and this community could arise. But 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 would the UN recognize this new mm -hmm. country? Right. Because the UN might not want all these new nations, these competitive, dynamic, low tax citadels springing up. So it might be that the citadels will only exist in the digital world. They'll only exist in Decentraland. They'll only exist in our minds, in virtual reality. They won't actually exist in the physical world. The, the, I mean, it's, the digital conquest has already happened, but the physical, the, the physical conquest is a, is a different game altogether. Unless we get massive, massive hyperinflation right. uh, and, and fiat money starts losing its value, at which point you know, the world can change very quickly. And it's already in the process. I mean, look at look at this, uh, the whole global debt and, you know, the printing of, of whatever creation, of, you know, of, of trillions and trillions. I mean, it's the, the M2 money supply, it's just it's just mind boggling. <laughs> like, like it's it's pre programmed, pre programmed self destruction. <laughs> what, what else? Sure. Is but but, you know, Rome was debasing its currency it took 300, 400 years. Okay. And then, you know, it, yeah. it takes a long time. And, and, you know, how long have we been debasing money for? Since 1914, since 1971, since, since 2000, since 2008? You know, these are all big events that led to accelerated debasement, 2020, uh, of course, being the next one. But, but, you know, I just think there's too much. Are people going to suddenly stop using euros, and US dollars and sterling? They're not. It's too much. There's too much skin in the game. Right. So, I don't know. I mean, if, you know, if we reach a critical mass, if we reach hyper-Bitcoinization, if the game theory, the incentivization I game, you know, plays out, what do you think? hyper-Bitcoinization is a more uh, mm -hmm. likely... Uh, hyper-Bitcoinization is a more real possibility than total hyperinflation and monetary collapse of fear. Right. Exactly, and if you, that you, makes you have, sense. exactly, and if you know, if you have in addition to that, you know, if you have like key key players or decision makers, and we already see them, you know, it's not like everything white and black. I mean, I I do recognize, you know, there are politicians, decision makers, senators, Congress people, whatever, you know, like key like key people in 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 decision making processes uh, uh, that you know they 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 are uh, let's say they they do. Uh, carry within themselves the ethical principles. They see the vision. They understand. Maybe they're not do doing it for themselves, but maybe for their posterity, for their children. So uh, maybe there is a game theory playing out, and eventually we will have like more uh, secessions. You know, like states sec seceding from the federal uh, uh, entities, or or you know, uh, citadels, free private cities, or localized economies everywhere fracturized. Maybe maybe this is the way to go because let's you know let's play out the whole decentralization game you know it's it's listen i'd love that if it happened but and you know but look at what happened in catalonia you know scotland's been talking about succeeding but they're not even going to get their vote and look at you know britain trying to secede from the european union 
<laughs> failed. They tried to stop that. Yeah. Um, you know, look what happened when the Confederate States tried to secede from the United States. You know, they they had a war that went on for five years and killed however many millions, and they didn't get their way. So, um, you know, secession is nice in principle, but governments will not allow it willingly. Mm. And it's you know the smaller power, you know, Catalonia might the Catalonians might want secession, but the Catalonian army can't beat the Spanish army. So if Spain decides to send in the tanks to impose unity, there's not a lot that Catalonia can do about it. Okay, so we're com coming back to, you know, uh, square one. I mean, it's the uh, it's these control structures and the centralized structures, um, especially the military, industrial, whatever, governmental structures that will what do you think is the worst case scenario? Do you think is we're going to have civil wars, or, or, or do you think they're going to trigger whatever a war by you know uh, uh, perpetrating a false flag, or is there like scenarios you've you've already thought about? Yeah, I've thought about it a bit. I, I quite like that um, theory that there's never been a war between two countries that both have McDonald's. <laughs> Have one. you ever heard that? Yeah, <laughs> something similar like that. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. And uh, so I think that, you know, there's some I, I don't think I think there's been an example where that rule has been broken. I forget what it uh, what it was. But so there's some truth to that. And, you know, I can't see, for example, like England and France, for example, have been fighting for, you know, a thousand years. England and France, we've been, you know, and every now and then France conquers a bit of England and every now and then England conquers a bit of France. And the other day, Jersey, which is one of the English islands, but really it should be French because it's like <laughs> 10 miles off the coast of France. Right. And for some reason it's English or maybe it's more than 10 miles. But anyway, it's much closer to Normandy than it is to England. Um, uh, you know, there was an argument. I think the French threatened to turn off Jersey's power. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in an argument over fish. And so the England, the English sent in the Royal Navy. Now, this is last week. Now, I can't realistically see, you know, I can see all the flexing of muscles and mm -hmm. Macron always uh, likes to inspire anti-English sentiment in France uh, with his rhetoric. But I can't actually see France and England in this day and age actually going to war. But I do think, you know, here's another reason and you can say, well, we're going to get civil wars. And in a way, there are, we're already having civil wars. You know, we're in this huge period of division between left and right, between authoritarian and libertarian, between, you know, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, between uh, Remain and Brexit, between... Distractions. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. But they're all genuine divisions. Yeah. And, you know, there's a cultural war going on pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so, but, and there might be a riot and there might be a fight, but the difference, like 500 years ago, if you wanted to have a revolt, you know, the working people could actually win because there wasn't such a gulf between the weapons that both side has. But in the UK uh, and in Western Europe, you know, the people don't have guns. And the government does have guns. So the government has total power. It's slightly different in America, obviously. But here in the West, you know, it's pretty much impossible to overthrow your government except at the ballot box. Yeah. And we've already discussed how impossible that is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so even a civil war is unlikely. And so we have this sort of, it's a war of words. Uh, between countries, but I don't think it's actually going to be a war of guns. But there is definitely a war, you know, America and, and China are having a sort of proxy war. Mm -hmm. And if you buy the idea that COVID was a deliberate, deliberate chemical attack, then, you know, there is a, there's a definite, you know, there could be a chemical war. But I don't, I, I think the days of, for example, you know, Austria going to war with Hungary and... Oh. England going to war with France. I think, I think those days are 
are gone. I, I don't see that as a realistic possibility. And I do, but I do see, you know, for example, France imposed very heavy taxes about five or six years ago, a wealth tax on the super rich in France. And all the super rich in France came to London. <laughs> and as a result, and so in terms of population, London is now the fifth biggest city in France <laughs> by, I mean, po by population of French. Yeah. So I see those kind of competitions going on. Just hold on one second. Somebody's calling me and I do need to speak to them. Sure. Um, should, I, should I stop it? Um, no, it's okay. I just, okay. just email them. Sure. Yeah, I want to... I want to wrap this up anyway, uh, Dominic. I want to respect the time and uh, want to ask you, like, on a positive note, because I know you have children you know, of your own. Like, do you have three kids or something? Uh, four. You have four children, yeah, but four. probably grown up or more or less, right? I mean, uh, uh, twenty. Uh, do I look that old? They're no, 20, just... <laughs> 18, uh, 16 and fifteen. Yeah, okay, because I saw the forward, you know, uh, like whom you dedicated the book uh, to. Oh, and, I see. Okay. You know, no, the, the reason I'm asking, you know, I, we have a, we have my girlfriend, we have a four month baby girl, you know, we love her, you know, like you do your children uh, more than life. Um, yeah. A, you, know, po you know, trying to, you know, trying to end this on a positive note, what do you think, are your children, are we, are children gonna, in what kind of world are they gonna live in? What kind of civilization are they gonna prosper, evolve? Uh, are we going to finally, you know, experience true freedom, you know, and prosperity and evolution in, let's say, whatever, 10, 15 years? There's a contradiction there. Because <laughs> there's, there's different sorts of freedom. Right. Um, so I use the level of to which you're taxed as a measure of freedom. How much of your own labor do you own? Um, so in North Korea, a worker owns zero percent or maybe 10 percent of his own labor. And in an anarchy where there's no taxation, the worker owns all of his own labor. And in the social democracies of the West, we're somewhere around 45, 50 percent of GDP. So we own about half of our own labor. At the turn of the 20th century, that figure was about 10%. So in that respect, we are much less free than we were at the turn of the 20th century, than we were 100 years ago. Much less free. But on the other hand, we have the internet, we have smartphones, we have computers, we have aeroplanes, we have cars, we have telephones, we have a million things that we can do now that just were not possible then we can fly anywhere in the world drive anywhere in the world sail anywhere in the world access to unlimited communication we can talk to anyone anywhere in the world so in that respect we're much more empowered and much more free than we've ever been so you know it's a bit of a balance there but in terms of things like life expectancy and quality, like you could take the poorest woman in London or the poorest woman in Paris and she would have a lifestyle that is infinitely better than Marie Antoinette. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Especially with Bitcoin, who, uh, Dominic, right? I mean, it's the it's a, it's a, it's a hardest, scarcest money we've ever, uh, you know, been sure, discovered. Sure, but uh, you leave aside Bitcoin. Right. Leave okay. Gotcha. Bitcoin for the second. Okay. Like, because let's assume that the poorest woman in London doesn't own any Bitcoin, but she still has a smartphone and homeless people have smartphones. She has access to running water, to electricity, uh, to motorized transport. She has access to all these things that Marie Antoinette never had. So, of course, she never has the status that Marie Antoinette had. So in many ways, even for the very poorest people, life is better now than it was 50 or 100 or 200 or 300 years ago in many ways. So in that respect, you have to say that life is getting continually better. We're living longer. We enjoy higher standards of living. There are many things we've lost. We've lost communities. We've lost the sense of family, uh, the, the, the unity of family that once existed. We've lost a lot of camaraderie. We've lost contact with nature. But these are all things that, that can be solved and we're rediscovering. So there's many things that we've lost. 
But on the whole, I would say the lives that our children have are likely to be better than the lives that we had. Um, but there's going to be a cluster flip of mess to do with government that they're going to have to navigate along the way. But even so, you know, we only notice history is one constant evolutionary process of improvement punctuated with lots of bad things that happen on the way. Mm -hmm. Now, the constant gradual, in, like if you compare the first iPhone that you could get in 2008, whenever it first came out, compared to the iPhone now, right. they're like two different machines. Right. But over the course of each iPhone, you don't really notice it. It's only when you take two distinct things at two extremes that you notice the improvement. And so, so you don't see this in the news. You don't see the, 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 they don't report good news. They only report the bad stuff. Yeah. So you constantly think, oh shit, it's getting worse. It's getting worse because the, the general cumulative, you know, this is the power of compound interest that goes unreported. So it's important to stand back and recognize that actually we're quite lucky to be born when we're born we're probably born at one of the best times in history to be born you know even you know life now is probably better than it was in the enlightened societies of ancient china or ancient greece no matter how much how enlightened they were life's probably better now so i think we do need to recognize that yeah you know dominic the, the reason I, I i brought up bitcoin of course is is because you mentioned the beginning you know uh ubi you know i'm i'm to be honest with you i'm for the transition phase i'm totally for ubi but the thing is we don't even need ubi once we are rooted you know in bitcoin uh as you know with the hard scarce money with localized economies with deflationary technologies because it is the savings technology because it will appreciate exponentially in purchasing power so so people finally you know have a cushion have a you know a financial uh, a monetary, you know, existential uh, uh, pillow, you know, to, to rest on. Uh, this is why I brought this up. But uh, I really uh, enjoyed our conversation, Dominic. Uh, is there anything, uh, uh, final thoughts or, or, or links or infos you want to give my listeners? No, I'm sorry that I got interrupted uh, in the middle of it, but I'm, I'm back in the room. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. I always enjoy talking about all of these subjects. And, um, the, there's lots to be optimistic about, there's lots to be worried about, and we all need to go quietly about our business of overthrowing the system. <laughs> I love your, your subtle uh, it, way, style. <laughs> do it discreetly. Exactly. Do it discreetly. Discreetly. Well, in that sense, well, thank you so much, Dominic. I hope to, you know, we can, we can repeat this maybe sometime in, in the form of a panel discussion in the future, but it was really amazing. So um, lots of things to think about. All right. No so, problem. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. All right. So I I really enjoyed this talk with Dominic. I really was really looking forward. He's a comedian. He's a really, you know, amazing researcher, author is in my eyes, you know, also investigative reporter. He's got amazingly critical thinking and, and, and views and perspectives. So I wanted to have him on. Uh, make sure you follow him on Twitter and read his books, uh, Daylight Robbery at um, and Bitcoin, the future of money and life uh, after the state. And yeah, if you have any questions, suggestions, let me know. My email address is kd at kvandavani.com. I'm the host of the Kvandavani Connection Show. And make sure you follow me on Twitter, subscribe to your YouTube channel and podcast platforms. And I'll see you around. Thanks. Bye.